This is All Things Esoteric Podcast, episode 18 on Earth. We are back. We are always going to start with Kate's astrological forecast. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to you, Anthony. It's good to get back on the air with you. You as well. It's been up too long. It has. And I just feel like we should maybe say a little bit of something about that. We are on our last element episode, Earth. And we talked about this before, if you've listened to any of the other element episodes about how, or any of the other episodes actually, how a lot of times we spend weeks with these energies researching and studying and really going deep and spending time with them very seriously. And it never fails that these energies are speaking to us often in our transits and often just in day-to-day life, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. So I just want to say the reason this took so long to get back on the air is because we both have been experiencing really strong transits. Not going to go into all that, not making excuses because we've really missed. But every time that... I took my hands to to try to connect and do this. Something will come up. And I also want to say I'm really having significant um, transits with my Pluto. So this is affecting my personal life big time. And what it is is I had my second Saturn return real quick and... Pluto simultaneously opposite my sun in just those transits alone there's something very deep going on and finishing at 59 in a few weeks Um, and it's very poignant and so this is why it was so strong and it happened to coincide with doing earth and if I've ever been in earth energy it's been the last six months of my life more than really ever that I because I knew I was in it versus before I was on autopilot, but this time I knew enough about Earth. We had been studying it. We were preparing for it months ago, right? It's been a oh, while. Yeah. It's at least three months. Yeah, it's been a while. And, and both of us have been experiencing really earthy situations. And everything's good because we both trust the process of life. And we know that we're working towards where our guides are taking us, where our intuition is taking us, and there's no fear or anxiety. Although there's times when these transits are so poignant that I tell you what, if I wasn't grounded to Earth, Earth showed me I needed Earth and I didn't want it. And I think that a lot of people can tap into that where they're just called to the ether they're they're called to the spiritual realms and they're called to do spiritual work and they're called to be healers and shamans and channelers and psychics and it keeps them very much up in that higher energy level of life and then they wake up and they're on this heavy earth and I personally before getting into the sky map just want to say that I've been brought down a few notches Anthony been like, no, Matt, I'm going to remind you, especially Pluto, and I'm just going to say it like this. If there's children around, you don't want them to hear this. Uh, Pluto would say and has said, no, you don't understand. I'm death. I'm death of the ego. And I will have my way, and it will happen. And until that happens, you're not going anywhere, said Saturn, my second return, who is limitation and restriction in time so Pluto and Saturn working together is that fire that gets purified over and over where all the dross is removed and finally you have the pure gold and I'm working towards that and it's been an incredible experience and I really want to probably do a side project on it because it's it's been so profound but I just wanted to say that about Earth and how where I've been, and um, it's been a beautiful mess. <laughs> a beautiful mess. That's what it's been, which Pluto often is. So Pluto transits are no joke. And with that, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Sorry, my mic stand is falling. 
I gotta make some noise for a second. Oh, of course, this, this no, you're leaving this and you know why? Because this mechanical bullshit is fucking earth as fuck. Earth heavy, yep. fucking heavy, heavy, mechanical heavy. bullshit that I don't want to deal with. It's called gravity. Gravity. Fuck, oh, fuck gravity. Fuck this little here. swivel mechanism on this fucking shit. I just, I just want to float around and do what I want, and I gotta deal with gravity and swivel I mechanisms know. and, and cars. You must because and, if you don't pay yeah. car insurance, you can't. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna come get your car, car payment in your house. Like it's real here. This is like, I don't know why we sometimes, I, I mean this, and there's nothing wrong with me psychologically, even though some of you might think there is. I'm telling you, there are days I sit here and I'm like, why did I agree to this? I feel like I did not. Look, listen to me, Anthony. I know, <laughs> know that I knew you up there, dude. So you're part of the problem, and I want to know what the fuck you think is going on. I'm part of the problem. You're part of me having to be here on Earth, and I don't know why. Oh. Well, I guess I you're part you, of my must, problem, too, there then. There must be a reason. If you're well, part of I mean you're is, my problem. Okay. Yeah, what I meant is, finish business. you're not the problem. Earth is the problem. That was well, what I meant when well, I said Earth, problem. I should Earth have said is, that better. Earth is where we go to work out our problems. Works. Okay, are we ready? I'm ready. Yes, my shit is fixed. Let's it's go fixed. to did fucking you? Capricorn. Well, this guy man, man. I got right. Time. Right. But did you want to say anything about Earth in your experience from the last podcast? Anything you want to say? Ugh. <laughs> I mean, you said it right. best, but um, Ugh and Earth doesn't care about your feelings or who dies and who lives or mm -hmm. none of that. It's mm -hmm. about getting the right shit in the right places, being in the right time at the mm -hmm. right place. And if you don't, you die. And Earth does not care. Right. It keeps going on now, doesn't it? Yep. Because the sun will rise tomorrow. Yep. I mean, until it doesn't, right? But... I got you on that, and and I think that that's really really true. Um, it's unforgiving, like granite on the side of a mountain, at yep. times. It's also very extremely, incredibly exhilarating, and it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever. Like it's incredible. Like I'm in awe of her beauty and her girth. Of course. And sky map. Let me see here. Let me get us pulled up in front of me. In front of me, there's a lot of really interesting things going on in the sky. And I can only allude to a few things. Now, I pulled this at 5.30. This is New York, New York, using Placidius. And here's where we're at. All right. If you've been listening to any of our podcasts, you know we've been talking about Taurus, Taurus, Taurus um, in the North Node. And it is still there. But we have Uranus making a conjunction very close to Taurus and Mars has gone into Taurus. So there's a theme here that we really need to grab on uh, for a minute. When we see Uranus and the North Node and Mars and Taurus at this degree, this is some building up energy that's been going on for a while. We have been talking about the squares and the tug and the, and the pull with Saturn um, and Uranus and uh, Saturn and the North Node and things like this. So now where we're at, when we get to July with Mars coming into Taurus, Mars is going to open up some energies and it's going to help us to guide our paths to move past because the North Node is involved here. Something. And to break away, this is Uranus and Mars, Uranus the rebel, Mars the energy, that is going to bring a freedom and a liberation to our lives and that's what a lot of what's been going on with people in the last couple of years with this north node in Taurus we've been talking about this we've been feeling and it's been this push pull and what do I do and where do I go and oh I'm back to where I was and no this doesn't feel right but I can't go here and it's gonna be helping us to move away from what no longer serves us and allowing us to have our true independent, revolutionary expression authentically, Uranus, authentically of who we really are. 
and we're going to come out and wait. And, and you've seen these processes taking place if you're following any communities out there socially. We're seeing this happen. And I mean, here's a really good example of this. A really good example was I saw a meme today. Whether you agree with this or not, that's not what this is about, okay? I'm not forming an opinion. I'm just sharing back what I viewed. And it was a young boy, oh, 16, 17 maybe, and he had a red sequin jacket and the biggest smile on his face and glasses, and he was just really cute and happy. And then he had a flowing red dress, and he went to prom. And everybody celebrated him, not maybe because they agreed, because I'm quite certain in a high school of that many people, not everybody's going to be the same way, but they celebrated this individual for the willingness to come out and be who they are authentically and makes them happy. If, if we care more about what somebody wears than the contents of their hearts, we're really going to have a problem in life. You're going to have a hard way on Earth. And Earth is changing right now. A Taurus is Earth energy. We're about to get into this, right? This is second house Venus, sensual resources, things you feel, the bull of Wall Street himself energy, right? Really, really strong energy. And we're seeing this internal work going on. Um, from where we've been and what we're seeing it on the earth through this boy that I was just talking about, this young man. And I saw it and I smiled because it's like if that's not Uranus in North Node conjunct, I don't know what is. <laughs> you know, uh, Liberace, think this, you know, people that are just, um, I, have you ever known a Taurus, Earth, second house person? I haven't really kept track until recently, so it's hard to know. I tell you, I have, and um, they're some of the most giving, down-to-earth, generous, feeling, sensing people, often healers, often teachers uh, can be Tauruses. But anyway, um, that's what's going on with these three planets, and Mars has uh, just gone into Taurus, so it's going to be there for quite a while, helping us to push forward. In fact, until April 2023, we're going to be seeing these energies. So I would say to people, look where your North Node is. Look where your Uranus is. And look where your Mars is. And do a transit report and look at what they're trying to speak to you right now because chances are you're really going to see um, some serious, serious movement. And I wanted to read something from Astro Astrological Transits. I do not own this. The Beginner's Guide to Using Planetary Cycles to Plan and Predict Your Day, Week, Year, or Destiny, April, Elliot Kent. And it says this, Transiting Uranus in Aspect to the Natal North Node. And if this doesn't sound like what's going on right now in our country, I'm speaking mostly in America, because that's what I'm privy to, um, culturally anyway. You have a dream. Some days it feels truly unreachable. You take tentative steps toward it, but something stops you. Or there are disappointments, or you end up stopping yourself just short of your destination. The moon's north node represents the dream, the brass ring, that seems to perpetually elude your reach. When transiting Uranus makes an aspect to the natal north node, you reach out again, Hopeful that this will be the time that the dream comes true. And surprisingly often it will. That's because Uranus is a rule breaker and refuses to agree with your internalized beliefs about why achieving your dreams simply isn't possible. You may not realize the entire dream in precisely the way you'd imagined you would. Sometimes you simply grab something else that's wonderful that you never went looking for but that presented itself nonetheless. But reaching for the dream means you're getting closer to it. And when you eventually get there, Uranus will be cheering you on. So it's not an easy place. It's a place where it's asking us to have grit and to dare and to not fear anymore. And isn't that what's happening? I mean, look at the women in this abortion issue, Roe versus Wade. 
I mean, that's a big deal, right? This is what we're seeing. And where is this taking place? On Earth, obviously. Um, but in a very practical way in front of our eyes. What I took from that was the importance of direction. Because like, like you said, even if the thing that you end up doing in the end isn't what you originally set out to do, but it presents itself because you set out to do something, you know, it's just important to have a goal to go places, you know, rather than going nowhere. You know, even if you don't go exactly where you thought you'd end up, it's always better to have a goal, you know, for sanity, you know, for mental health as well. But also in the long term, you know, it's always better to go new places and you open yourself up to new opportunities rather than doing what you've always done and never trying. That's beautiful insight. I agree with that. That's, I think that um, that would be the cheer of what Taurus is trying to say with, with those placements. Exactly what you just said. It doesn't get any better than that. So Mars is there. Check your Mars, guys. Check your Taurus really at 18 degrees. That would be a great thing to check. Where is your Taurus at 18 degrees? And this is where this energy is trying to speak to you. So happy Cancer season. We went into July. All right, listen, I wanted to bring this out too. There's a couple things that are popping here that aren't normally talked about, which is why I like to bring in the goddesses. I'm really interested in the asteroid goddesses and how they've worked in my life. And in my own chart, it's just unbelievable when you start to get in there and take a really good look. You can see these archetypes and energies wanting to direct you in a certain way. We have a lot going on in Cancer, but two things I want to point out is the sun is at 15 degrees. It was at 530. It's a little more now. It's moving slowly. But 15 degrees, 44 minutes in Cancer. Halfway through the Cancer season. And black... Moon Lilith, or Lilith, let's not say Black Moon because there's different types, but Lilith herself is conjunct that sun within 20 seconds of touching each other. Okay, not just that, on the other side of Lilith is Hades, another asteroid that is very strong. Uh, Lilith herself deals with dark energy, not, um, when I say dark, let's just, I'm sorry, I feel like I need to explain this. Dark not as in who creepy Satan, devils, evil. No, dark is in the absence of light, which isn't necessarily evil. There's just no light. Depends on how you look at it. Conjunct Hades at eleven degrees in Cancer. Conjunct Mercury. Okay, so we have this conjuncting cancer going on between two super strong places uh, asteroids and then we have Venus in Gemini, and then we have Hecate in Gemini, both at 17 degrees. So the Sun and Lilith in Cancer at 15 degrees, Venus and Hecate at 17 degrees in Gemini, with Mercury in between them. So what is the significance of that? Venus is highly involved with Earth energy. She rules Taurus and Libra, but we're dealing with Taurus Earth tonight in just a minute. So that she's in the seventh house at the beginning of this podcast at 17 degrees conjunct Hecate, which is on my son, which I identify with greatly, is pretty crazy that uh, we would be communicating this. But what Hecate would say there is, I wish you to look into the deepest places of your relationships and I wish you to let true Venus love triumph. Because if anything um, is more beautiful, isn't it the Empress card sitting on the earth in her full belly, just embellished with the archetype series in just earth itself. And Venus is here. And Venus would speak through Taurus and say, make your relationships beautiful. Let them be of the highest degree that you can, however that looks, but it begins with truth because Hecate doesn't play. She doesn't play. And she demands truth. And so with her strongly conjunct in the seventh house in Gemini, 
wow, that's very powerful. And now those have probably moved on since we started, but uh, they're close to each other for a while. Mercury there wanting to what? Communicate even further as a messenger, get the message out. And what? In the Cancer sign. I'm a Cancer sun. You're a Cancer ascendant. What are the We're going to talk about our feelings. Well, you know what I mean. It's quite now. It's going to get real practical because we're getting ready to go in that strong earth. But we're, we we must not forget that these energies are also in the chart. And um, if you're interested in the goddesses, they're really worth peeking into. They do show up in your chart. You can plot them. So uh, more could be said. But the big theme there is that North Node and Taurus with Uranus and Mars, and then these asteroids. So with that. Um, did you want to add, add anything yep. to the and the words yeah. of Absol all I got is goddesses I'm a heroin addict now I'm ready to move on you said that before man I don't think people are going to understand where you're coming from with that well so they can look it stuff. up I don't know nope. they can look oh, you, it up you say it <laughs> When I mention the goddesses, I got it. Okay, yes. Well, listen, they're intriguing and they're powerful and the feminine is half of the deal. So, um, really important to look at them. Okay, so, going into Earth from the Encyclopedia of Earth by Miles Kelly. And I better keep forgetting all your the shit. whole book is on Earth, like, hardcore earth how earth works like very practical earth not above earth and you know ethereal like earth dude like earth 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 and i really learned a ton so i encourage people study planet earth there's a lot that is very much like the human body um it's really quite crazy when you start getting into its systems and that there may be life inside it Hollow. Oh, right, the core <laughs> and all of that thing. There could be, you know, people have talked about that, but um, I don't know. But the formation of, of Earth, um, how exactly the Earth got formed, so to speak, it's debated, I think, by many, <laughs> including our top scientists and thinking minds of today. Uh, but having said that, in, in my research, mainstream science communities, they all seem to agree on the following points. And it's that Earth was roughly formed 4.57 billion years ago. Now, this is what science is telling us, okay? That um, it came from star debris that spun around the newly formed sun and clumped into rocks called planetesmals, P-L-A-N-E-T-E-S-I-M-A-L-S. I I don't know how to pronounce it. Didn't look up how to pronounce it. Sorry. But these were pulled together by their own gravity to form planets, including Earth and Mars. And the Earth was a seething mass of molten rock. This is what they think it happened. And after 50 million years, a giant rock collided with the newborn Earth and the impact threw out debris, which gradually joined together to become the moon. What do you think of this? I don't know. I've heard about this before, but the moon is also suspicious. But that's another topic. <sighs> that's another topic. Isn't it? <laughs> yep. The shock of the impact that formed the moon made iron and nickel collapse towards the Earth's center. They formed a core so dense that its atoms fused in nuclear reactions that have kept the inside of Earth hot. So that's how the core got formed. Like, how did they determine this is what I want to know. Geologists are good with rocks. I mean, a lot of it's guesswork, too. I mean, you can never know for sure. Well, then a molten rock formed a mantle around the core, and the core's heat keeps the mantle warm and churning like a boiling treckle. T-R-E-A-C-L-E? Is that how you say that? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) The surface cooled and hardened to form a thin crust. Okay. Then meteorites and asteroids and all that stuff smashed against the crust. 
sprawled for like 3.9 billion years or whatever. And steam and gas billowing from volcanoes form the Earth's first poisonous atmosphere. The steam condensed to water. And apparently the first Earth day was only 15 hours long. Hmm. So, that's just kind of like some earthy, earthy facts. But... Um, I wanted to say this, in having studied now as a, in naturopathy for school, the inside of our bodies so much, um, and understanding how the biology works and all of our different systems, right? Well, our internal and earth chemistry is very similar, and we're made up of all that surrounds us. And I wrote this here. I said, as we consume her, taste her, and experience her bounty, we adapt, grow, change, and evolve in our individual and collective Earth consciousness. We are subject to her cycles of life, death, and renewal. We are so eloquently reminded through the band Kansas that we are just dust in the wind. That's why it says, to dust you were born and to dust you shall return, or whatever that quote is. Uh, dust to dust. Kansas' song says, the same old song, just a drop of water in the endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground, though we refuse to see. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. You know, literally our bodies return to dust if we heat them. They return to what the very stars are made of. But, listen, man, no one leaves this planet alive in their flesh coat that we were born into. It's got to be shed and cracked open through bodily death. And, and when you look, and our spirit leaves, right? When you look at Earth, that's how Earth is. So our chemicals, our internal systems, and, and just the cycles of nature itself reveal to us. And about what you just said, that's why the star goddess is the mother of the earth goddess, right? Because all the matter in us originally came from, and earth originally came from the stars. That's where it was made. Right. Right. And it just got so real to me. You know, like, wow. E each of our chemical interactions and reactions within us and upon the earth, they carry a vibration within the molecular structure. Like, this is where we manifest. This is where we take us and put it out. You know, for me to learn and understand and then use these energetic footprints and archetypes that uh, connect to me is to create further alchemy. Once I learn them and integrate them, because they've, they've been here, you see what I'm saying? Yes, we need to have new, but Earth would say tried and true. Use what's tried and true, right? Earth mm. is very earthy. <laughs> of course. And you um, mentioned frequency, like, and literally, physically, we can literally not, not vibrate. If we were to stop vibrating, that would be the same as reaching zero degrees Kelvin, which has never been done before. Because you see temperature, temperature is a measure of how fast the matter is vibrating. So the, the slower the vibration, the lower the temperature. And the lowest temperature possible, when you finally get that piece of matter to stop moving, is zero degrees Kelvin, and it's never been reached before in any lab under any conditions. They've gotten very close to it, but it's literally never been done before and might not be possible within the laws of physics. So tell me exactly what that is. It's vibration. If we're vibrating, then we have a frequency by definition. I'm saying all when people hear vibration and frequency, they think it's all woo-woo. When it all is very earth, very physical, physicists will tell yes. you that we're all vibrating all the time. So about vibration, you were talking about that, and um, that is really true, which is what led me into Reiki. 
I discovered a lot about personal and outer energy, what we call chi or life force. That same vibration that's tied to earth, that's tied to the way earth moves and the waves, is also within us in waves and within us. And it, it's our life force. And uh, that's just yet a whole nother level of alchemy that I was just blown away uh, and became a Reiki master. Uh, it took me quite a while. And it's just been one of the best experiences of my life because I use... Um, the Reiki is an alternative therapy for the treatment of physical, emotional, and mental diseases. You want to just put it simply. And there's a whole story behind it. I encourage you to go to ReikiAssociation.net Reiki-facts.php Reikiassociation.net slash Reiki-faqs.php And you'll learn about uh, Dr. Macau, you see, who's from Japan. And, um, the story goes that he was really stimulated by some students' questions. You know, they kept asking him questions about energy and healing and um, he embarked on a long search for the origins of healing, you know, and how healing worked and why it worked and took him years and he would ask him questions like, can anybody do it and can it be taught and how does it work? So he studied Western and Eastern traditions and went on a 21-day uh, fast on a mountain <coughs> and in deep meditation he was given symbolic tools, symbols, and information that form the basis of Reiki. So I'm directly tied back to him by like 12 people, which is pretty cool. But there's more to history to Reiki, and I just want to encourage you, that is a very practical way of taking this life force energy and using it on Earth. Like this is a place where these energies that are not only in Earth, they're in us, want to be used on Earth. And, and the example of that, if you believe, would be the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? Mm. And other healers that we know of. Uh, Mother Teresa in her own right, and other people that miraculously heal. But they use they use the energy, and I have to think that being on earth has something to do with being able to ground to be able to use that powerful energy because without earth it would all be ether do you know what I mean interesting yeah it would all be it's the other pole it's the other side of the battery it is and we must have it and this is where we must accept earth and we must work with earth and a lot of people like I said, that you know, star seeds, people that are shamans, uh, healers, people that work in astrology, things like this. You know, if they have a lot of Neptune and a lot of water, they they can really be challenged um, with just being grounded on Earth. And often that's all it is. If you're feeling a certain way, I want to encourage you. It probably is you just need some grounding. And the best way to do it is no devices. Go out in nature. This is what I do. You sit right on the Earth. And you just close your eyes and you just say, you know, for right now, I'm not going to think. And if I do, that's okay. But I'm just going to take 3D press and I'm just going to listen around and don't make it hard and just sit. And be still if you can. It does more than we realize. Because we've not been taught these things. We've lost them and part of the Virgo, Pluto, Uranus generation, which I'm a part of in the 10th house, is to bring these new techniques out and new ways of doing things in practical healing ways I can really identify with where we're at right now and I feel like I was born for such a time as this like I'm right on this earth at this time I feel like I knew I never used to feel this way but instead of feeling like okay you know I just want to get out of here I've experienced it because we've talked about that right I actually feel like no okay there's a real mission here like there's there's really something that is calling me to to do here, and uh, I need to be about my way about it, and just understand 
you know, you are on earth and you can have all these lofty ideas and all these things you want to do, but if you can't ground them, how does that even help you? Right? Right. Of course. You can read your books all day on philosophy and yeah. magic, but like unless you do yeah. anything with it, it's all theoretical. Right. That's right. So Earth only has one natural satellite, the moon. And I really want to encourage you, listen to our moon episode. Quote, unquote, natural. Um, pr preferably late at night while you're all relaxed and maybe you know, enjoying your recreational activities and light a candle <laughs> for the moon. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know how well it will go over. But moon people will love the moon episode, I have a feeling. Capricorn. Oh, you're going to start with Capricorn. Very well. No I just problem. like to I just like to keep it in the pattern of uh, passive, uh, what's it called, uh, cardinal, fixed, mutable. We can change it up if you want. No, nope, I'm perfectly fine. I'm able to do that. Why don't you introduce Capricorn, though? All right. Well, Capricorn is cardinal. That is the way that it operates. And we know that cardinal is energy that pushes forward initiates. If you want to think of cardinal energy, I always point people back to the first house, which Aries runs, and Mars. This is the seed bursting through the ground. This is getting out of the gate. This is moving forward. This is leadership. Um, and with it in the 10th house, which it runs, you're dealing with the planet Saturn. This is the home of the career the home of the Viri. Thank you Often so much. represents the father oh. opposite. Oh, uh, you cut out. I thought you stopped. Sorry, don't let me stop you. No. Um, it represents the father, 10th house in government. 10th uh, house is up at the fourth house of home. So you know, a lot of people place the mother in the fourth or her, her um, more of her moon impression because that's Cancer's house, female feminine. Capricorn is feminine, which when I first started studying years ago on Capricorn, I almost fell out of my chair when I read that. I have that Pluto, Venus, excuse me, well, Pluto, hmm. Uranus well, can jump. That's interesting. In because Earth is feminine, but it's active Earth. It's the masculine part of Earth, which is feminine. So, I mean, it's kind of a hybrid. Well, Capricorn is feminine. All feminine signs are receptive within astrology. It's cardinal because it's, you're correct in this. The cardinal is yang, masculine energy. So, yes, you're right. I see where you're getting that. So, it does have that duality within it where it's pushing out. The 10th house has to do with what you attain. So, you think by the time you're at the 10th house, you're 21 years old. You've made your way almost all the way around the chart. Capricorn, I see, is a testing sign. It's a place where you will be tested because it's it's where you land with what you do, so to speak. What you know, your hands are the sixth house, yes, a Virgo, but it's where what your hands end up doing right? It's where you end up out there and where you are seen. So it's, it's, a, it's a house that requires you to be very grounded and to steadily Saturn work your way towards a goal. Capricorns would say, how can I use this? <laughs> Them how, hands. How can I, yeah, what, what's that? Them hands. Yeah, what can I do with this? How can I build you know, it's, it's, it's pentacles, earth energy, right? So this is a material world and stability. And Saturn, wherever it is, is going to be tied back to the archetype of Capricorn and Aquarius. Because they do assign Saturn to Aquarius too. When I think of Capricorn, I really think of people that know how to stay the course and are reliable and aren't really very feely and tend to be cooler and colder. And I'm going to say mean, but they can appear that way because they're so earthbound. They're so earthbound that they can't see the forest through the trees, if that makes sense. Very Have you come across so. that? 
very much so. It like I work with all my life my dad who is a Capricorn and an electrician and he is cap very very Capricorn. Like it doesn't matter you know the power doesn't go on unless you get the right wires through the right pipes and connect everything the right way. And if you don't do that, it doesn't matter how upset you are about it. It doesn't matter how hot you're going to be because there's no AC. It doesn't matter whose grandma is going to die because there's no AC. Earth doesn't care. You have to get those wires through those pipes or the shit is not going to work. And emotion has nothing to do with any of that. You know, I got to tell you, that is so spot on. Capricorns are accused of being cold and insufficiently concerned about those close to them. This is from Isabel M. Hickey, classic work on spiritual astrology, astrology of cosmic science. I do not own this information. She says, this is true if Saturn or the sun has afflictions in the chart. Then they are apt to want their own way regardless of the other people's feelings. They may not consider the fact that every individual has a right to his own feelings and his own freedom. The antidote for an afflicted Saturn is Venus. Love is the healing force that dissolves arrogance and selfishness. Because love isn't like, I'm going to let you walk all over me. Love just says, you do you and I'll do me. And I'm not going to be in conflict with you right. because I don't agree with it. And That's there's a always big the, difference. the feminine force putting the male ego in its place. That's been a theme in my life many times. Mm, that's beautiful. I think that's beautiful. Because it will. Love never fails. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's just what kind of love are you using? Some people are like, no, it doesn't fail. I love that motherfucker my whole life. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, well, you know, did, did, you, did you? Did you not love yourself first, though? Because you've got to love yourself first. If you don't love yourself mm. first, it's really hard to love other people. <coughs> it just is. Otherwise, you're loving other people to get love because you don't love yourself. And that becomes a whole convoluted mess of which Capricorn does not want to be involved in, by the way. Saturn is his planet, her planet, and very, very, very serious, right? We've talked about Saturn a ton. Yep. And Saturn episode. Listen to, our, listen to our episode, yep, on Saturn. All right, what did you want to say? I'm pretty much tied up with Capricorn. And then we're really being general here, guys. There's so much more you could yes. say. Um, that please was research fantastic. it for yourself. Thank you very much. That was a great introduction to Capricorn. I have, as always, for our referencing to astrology, I have Your Place in the Sun, officially authored by Evangeline Adams. So about Capricorn. In dealing with money, this native is scrupulously faithful, but his lack of imagination makes him penny-wise and pound-foolish. He is the best man in the world to entrust with money for safe investment. He will handle it carefully and intelligently. He will render an account of it to the last cent, but he will be too cautious to make big coups with it. Unless the Capricorn native be uplifted by good dignities, these qualities are apt to degenerate into penuriousness. In speech and writing, the native of the sign will be direct, sometimes eloquent, but there will be no originality in either matter or in style. This tends to be dry, but is sometimes very ornate and elaborate in a conventional way. This native is very fond of illusion. He interlards both speech and writing with classical phrases and artificial images or metaphors or Rococo effervescence, which has in it very little of spontaneous growth. The style, even when most impassioned, is academically perfect. And Gladstone and Macaulay are good examples of this kind of expression at its best. There is always a certain aridity which does not make for permanence. One always gets the effect of artificiality and strain. It is too painfully clear that the native has said exactly what he meant to say, whereas scriptural injunction is, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given to you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. In modern language, the native lacks inspiration. 
The native never loses consciousness of himself as distinguished from other people. He does not understand that he can only realize himself by losing himself in the beloved. It is this quality which the mystic instinctively recognizes as the supreme evil. In love, the native is very self-centered, not understanding that this sentiment must be mutual. He does not feel even true jealousy. He is not wounded by infidelity. He is merely robbed. He is quick and unrestrained in appetite with little appreciation of delicacy. It is almost safe to say that one never finds real sexual perversion or inversion with this sign. If degeneracy exists, it is purely animal. Where good planetary influences exist, the rule is that the native becomes conventional domesticated citizen. Capricorn is often overbearing and often tyrannical. Capricorn is overbearing and often tyrannical in his treatment of children. He is not actively or consciously cruel. He is merely cold and unsympathetic. And the individuality of the child is offensive to the parent who makes rules which may perhaps be in accordance with righteousness or good discipline, but which are so rigid that only the most poor-spirited children can confirm to them without suffering. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's what I had for that part. I think that that really reeks of uh, parenting in the last 30 years. Mm. Like, like I grew up with, maybe I know you didn't because of the age gap, but I grew up with, I don't understand why you want me to do that. The answer was, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. Do it. There was no, oh, yeah. and, and you're like, well, not all homes are that way. Of course not. But there was this general theme of, you know, spanking, whipping with belts. Spanking was totally common. In fact, your neighbor could spank you. Teachers could spank you. All kinds of, um, like, man, heavy, earth-handed. That's how I see Capricorn, because it's government. Tenth yeah. house represents government. If you see a son there, somebody's probably in the military, or Trump has a son, I believe, in the tenth house. Yeah, that, that just that kind of heavy-handed way of being in parenting. Yeah, I mean... That. That definitely speaks to me because both my parents were Capricorns. I mean, even though I'm pretty young, I mean, that the ex being extra nice to your kids, woke bullshit, participation, trophies, I mean, that really, that attitude didn't exist in my house. Saturn's connected to Capricorn. And in something in astro astrology is ley lines and energy lines. And you can do astro cart Cartography, I think that's how you say it. Astrocartography, pardon me, sorry guys. I don't study it. I've looked at it. I'm starting to dig into it. But you basically can look at the lines and you can see the planetary influences that affect those lines. Where I'm from, the Saturn line goes right over Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I grew up with this really hardcore, you know, uh, blue collar work really, really hard for really long hours to the detriment of your family kind of thing. Fathers weren't warm. You know what I mean? Maybe, again, it was Warmness just doesn't pay the bills. That was no, the thing, and pretty much. That's right. It was. It was very practical. Very, very, very practical. And it, it makes sense that Saturn would be there. Well, I had my second Saturn return to the day and I was home in Wisconsin. And the events that brought me there, somebody else planned. And we got invited to it. So the odds of me being there on the exact day my Saturn return went exact is absolutely... If, you know, I, I have left home, so to speak. So the odds of me being back home, it's pretty crazy that that, that happened. And I really saw in my relatives hard-working Saturn energy material things were very important and working hard and it's respectable to work and it is I get it I'm not knocking it I'm not knocking having nice things on this earth I'm not knocking going to work every day and providing for your family you know that's important but if you put 
things that are out of priority with a, that a family needs to thrive and survive. They don't just need you to make money. They need you to right. be there. Because the devil, Capricorn, on its own, isn't good or evil. It's about the right amount and the right time and place. You know, in the Tarot, Earth is associated with heaviness, matter. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like things Slow. that are just, yeah, pentacles. Why in the direction took so long to get here, this episode? Yeah, it is so true. The direction of Earth is north. And I know that you have the devil. There's other cards associated, many. All the pentacle cards are Earth. All the pages are Earth. So take a look at, you know, put the cards out in front of you, look at all the pentacles and just work your way through them visually. Don't even read a book, just look at them. Let your subconscious look into them and see them from a different angle. Come away from Capricorn and Earth. <laughs> Go to water, my friend. Go to water. Anyway, the world card is Saturn. Yeah. Venus is Earth. And Hierophant is Earth. The Hermit is Earth. The Devil and the World. So you want to get a good look at Earth take a look at those cards. They speak volumes. Volumes. Did, did you want to go um, anywhere else with the tarot on that? Yes, I have, I have more on the devil, much more. Right on. So, out of all this shit talking we're doing on Capricorn, I'm about to turn it around a little bit because devil's not such a bad guy. Okay. Uh, we went over this mostly in, well, we went over this pretty well in the Pan episode. We went over the Devil card. So I'm only going to present some of the same information, and then I have some additional information that I did not get to last time. So reading from Understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot by Lon Milo Duquette, the Devil may not exist but there is most definitely a devil card in the tarot. And in my opinion, he is the most universally misunderstood character in the entire deck. This is the trump of Capricorn, the sign of the goat. Indeed, for the purpose of fortune telling, the devil has truly been the scapegoat for all the perceived evils that could befall us and the sinful temptations that are constantly luring us towards self-destruction. How convenient. But if the devil is supposed to be the card that represents evil, which card are we to pick to represent good? All the other trumps have the potential of representing the qualities of both good and evil. Why do we need one card for just evil? It should be obvious that the devil is something other than the ultimate evil. That something other is just what his full title proclaims. He is the lord of the gates of matter. That in itself can be pretty scary, especially if you've been convinced that earthly life is somehow in estrangement from God and that all things on the material plane, including you and me, are inherently evil. Grow up. Wherever the supreme being is, it would not be the supreme being if it weren't everything, including you and me and the devil. It seems pretty obvious that the devil is just God as misunderstood by the ignorant and the wicked. Oh, sure. Hmm. Transitioning. <laughs> now this next little bit is from the actual Book of Thoth, not understanding Book of Thoth. These, this is Aleister Crowley writing. The formula of this card is then the complete appreciation of all existing things. He rejoices in the rugged and the barren no less than in the smooth and the fertile. All things equally exalt him. He represents the finding of ecstasy in every phenomenon, however naturally repugnant. He transcends all limitations. He is Pan. He is all. Saturn, the ruler, is Set, the ass-headed god of the Egyptian deserts. He is the god of the south. That The name refers to all gods containing these consonants, such as Shaitan or Satan, sea magic, blah, blah, blah. Essentially, to the symbolism, essential, to the symbolism are the surroundings, barren places, especially high places. The cult of the mountain is an exact parallel. The Old Testament is full of attacks upon kings who celebrated worship in high places. 
This, although Zion itself was a mountain, in every symbol of this card there is an allusion to the highest things and the most remote. Even the horns of the goat are spiral to represent the movement of the all-pervading energy. Zoroaster defines God as having a spiral force. And of course, most spiritual New Agers know about the golden mean, golden ratio, forming the spiral, all that. But yeah, that, that's where I got on the devil. Within the tarot itself, um, the word devil is evil with a D in front of it. And it is also the word lived spelled backward, suggesting that living with the devil is existing, not living. There's a reason why the devil, I think, comes in the place that it comes within the deck at the time that it comes in the deck. And there's four gateways of life that I came across working through the trail, yet a deeper layer that I did not know. And there's childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and wisdom. And the cards take you on this fool's journey. So you've got adulthood is death card to the moon card. So you've got death, temperance, the devil, the tower, the star, and the moon. This is considered adulthood, which means these are the these are the growing years as an adult and the hard lessons of life. And there isn't any wrong or right. It just is. I just think that when I look at that card, it reminds me of my earthly nature and how I at times have forgotten that there is, for me, my belief, you don't have to believe this, but there is an after. My spirit, I know, will leave this casing, and I know that I'm still going to be alive. There's no way that this fire could just go out and not exist. There's no way. I feel too real. I feel too alive. I know that I'm speaking through an avatar. I get it. I'm grateful for it. But I tell you, Earth is is where the devil lives. Is that not what was said in the Holy Scriptures? We cast you down to earth like a snake on your belly. You know, it was the curse of um, the devil himself. What he did to Adam and Eve. Read it. It's in there. Whose domain is this? Every Christian will tell you. The devil's. The devil lives here to, to tempt you. I'm telling you, it is earth. It, it, it is, and that's what they mean by it, but they took it to a whole new level of, I don't think it's don't taste, don't touch, don't, don't, don't. I think it's do it in a way that's going to bring flow to your life and others while you're on this earth. And so that card in the middle reminds us, look, if you can get through this, it reduces to four. And that's a card of balance. Look at all the fours in the tarot. Especially number four, the emperor. So, that's all I have to say on the devil. A lot more could Good. be said. This is bowing me out. <laughs> What's that? It's so bowing you out? <laughs> bowing me out. Capricorn's well, heavy. Hey, I live in Capricorn is. every day at work. I know. I want to read something from Tarot of the Spirit by Pamela Eakins, PhD. I can't recommend this book enough, people. She says, The Path Through Earth, page 206. This is so profound. I must read it. Earth holds, protects, cradles, nurtures, feeds, and smothers. The body, made of earth, is the form that holds the fire, the water, and the wind of life. Earth is the vehicle for the spirit and the breath, the manifestation of life force, limitless substance. The earth itself, like the wind, is the offspring of the elemental universal forces of fire and water. The earth is seen as the daughter of the elemental forces. 
The earth is inert form, female and receptive, providing a body for the forces of intellect, emotion, spirit, will, and life force. Earth is a limitless substance of which all things physical are composed. Earth indicates all physical form. Physical forms are vessels containing life force. In other words, Earth is the form in which life, the force, is embodied. Mystics say, force is ensouled in form. That is fantastic. And I rose so high when I heard that in my spirit. Right. That made a so point much within sense the circle. Oh, yes. Like a cell. Like the sun itself in astrology. Right, and the point within the circle us. is also an old uh, Kabbalistic or alchemical metaphor for exactly what you just said. Yes, and it is the alchemical symbol for the sun in astrology is a circle with a dot in it representing that life is eternal. It is forever um, going on and on. You are in the center. You are the spark like a cell. The center is where life is. It's pretty fascinating when you start looking at these things. Thus, as the sons and daughters of sun and earth, we are force and soul and form. And we are form containing force. We are the vessels for new forms which are in turn and sold by force. So yeah, earth is our gift, she says. It's, it's our gift. And, and yes, it is heavy. But... Wow, look at the things that have been created here that are so beautiful it takes my breath away. Like right now, the sun in the west is beginning to set over my field and I can see a bunny rabbit out there and my cherry tree doing really well that we planted and you know the green grass and my dogs next to me laying on my bed all cozy like, dude, earth rocks. If yeah. you can balance everything else and I think that that might be a point here of why I was struggling at times is I wasn't balanced and, and through my experiences that I've had recently I've, I've had to really learn how to do that and I'm not perfect but I'm getting there I'm getting where it's becoming more of a natural process to stay in this place of groundedness or when, it, when I start to go back to older patterns at least I know where to go I don't caught myself saying, you know, you don't really have to experience that emotion right now. Like, you can just... It's okay. <laughs> you are air, Mr. Libra, so you probably have a hard time, maybe. I don't know, your cancer ascendant. So you might get that. But for me, I go to the emotions first. Not because I'm out of control. It's the way that I'm wired. I read. I no, sense, I'm definitely I more feel. emotional. Because I'm 55% water chart. Right. It's really yeah. uh, it's been challenging. That's yeah, all why the I air. The double Earth. <laughs> That's why I needed the double Earth in the tenth house was to ground me. Yeah, you yeah. do have air. All the air in the world doesn't matter at all if like your emotions aren't balanced. Oh, it's so true. Yet we can't be without emotion. Right. So we don't That's negate why them. We integrate like them in a healthy way. Netzach and Hod are on opposing sides of the polarity on the Tree of Life, the Mercury and Venus. Right. So we were talking okay. about the devil start Carl, Capricorn. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about Capricorn? No, I'm fucking done with Capricorn. Okay, well let me share this quick. The Earth signs are Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn, if you all haven't gotten that yet. I don't know if we like came out and just said that. But the more planets that you have in these Earth signs, the more practical and needful of security you are. Capricorn is concerned about Earth and setting up his kingdom on Earth. It's not a bad thing. We need Capricorns. They're leaders, often. Um, but they can negate um, other areas and then look for their security in things. 
look for their security in things instead of in possessions, which then can lead to all kinds of problems depending on what aspects you have and what other planets are there with your 10th house. So your 10th house can also, you know, not just other areas of the chart that people talk about, but the 10th house really can show how needy you are because of that strong earth energy. Because it seeks that material security. They're down to earth, pragmatic, cautious, sensible, and conservative signs. Hardworking, industrious. Earth signs are able to put into effect the ideas and the inspirations of other signs. So where you have Taurus, Virgo, Capricorn is where you have manifestation usually. They can be accumulative, possessive, and overly materialistic. Also sensual and pleasure-seeking. So if you've got a really crazy aspect with Mars and Venus over there to the 10th house, this could be somebody in love with Earth. Um, somebody that does love counseling for a living. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So deeply sensing nature, practical and neat and needful of security are these signs. And we've done Capricorn, so do you want to go into Taurus? Yep. Your intro was so lovely to the last one. Could you could you do that again? <laughs> okay. Right on man. All right, let me grab my notes here so I don't miss anything. All right, so Taurus, I saw in my research, um, also referring to Isabel Hickey here a couple times. I'll let you know when I direct quote. But she saw Taurus as the concentrator. Taurus operates as feminine yin energy. And again, the feminine signs are Taurus, Cancer, Virgo, Scorpio, Capricorn, and Pisces. These are receptive signs. Think of Earth. What does Earth do? Earth receives the seed, right? And then bounty reproduces, grows, gives us back, multiplies. Taurus is of the fixed quality. So we've moved from cardinal to fixed, which is a whole different animal. And the element of Earth, of course, and the qualities describe the fundamental modes of activity. We should have probably said that. The elements describe our temperament. So the qualities are how the element is behaving. And the element is our temperament, basically. And there's three qualities. They're cardinal, fixed, and mutable, as well as the four elements showing up in order, then alternating every four within the chart, fire, earth, air, water. So Taurus is fixed earth and fixed people, are very preserving and enduring. Quote, they achieve results in life through determined and persistent effort. They tend to do one thing at a time and are extremely practical in their approach to everything. And that is from Isabel Hickey, A Cosmic Science. Um, these signs are not very easily influenced by others. This is fixed energy on the earth. They can be firm and stubborn, thus the bull. We see um, when they put their minds to something, they're very focused, fixed energies, but they can also hold on to things. And this is where you see Tauruses have, you go into their homes and they, they just usually have a lot of really cool things. Like I went into my girlfriend's house, who's a strong Taurus, and it was like going into a shop. You know, she had the most unique, she just had stuff everywhere, but it didn't look heavy. I can't even explain it. It was like the most awesome experience. Huh. <laughs> she had stuff everywhere. But it was organized and it was just so cool. And there's a lot of women themes at her apartment. So it was kind of cool to go in there and read quotes and to see what she did with all that. Very persevering and enduring. They want to achieve results. They're determined. They put forth a lot of persistent efforts into things. Um... They will do one thing at a time. Tauruses are known for this and can be so practical that sometimes it gets in their way. Like they just want it to be so earthy, so reachable, touchable, doable. Um, they could kind of fuss about that. What else do I have here? 
specific signs, and I think we see it very strongly in Taurus, so going back to that stubbornness, the inflexibility of, you know, I've got my heels dug in here, and they're dug up, excuse me, they're dug into earth. Leo is fixed fire and Scorpio is fixed water and Aquarius is fixed air. So if you want to see how this fixed element comes out, look at these other signs and you'll get a really, really good idea. They call that the Grand Cross. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's worth looking into and researching. This podcast isn't on that. Taurus lives in the second house. Second house is a deeply personal house. You know, first house is the ascendant where you came in, your body, your physical body. We move past that. We go into the second house. This is tied to Venus, things, resources, your sense of groundedness, your sense of being able to place things on the earth, sensuality. Um, sometimes two things can be here as well. Um, Venus's relationships rules Libra, seventh house air energy. So it's worth looking at that theme as well. Okay, back over to you. Thank you. That was wonderful. So, from Your Place in the Sun by Evangeline Adams. Though Taurus represents the least active of the elements, and although its planetary influences are the passive Venus and the Moon, its cherubic nature of the sign is sufficiently strong to make its action upon the character thoroughly positive. For example, the influence of Earth in Taurus is to make the native intensely conservative, but this is not the conservatism of idleness or laziness or of contentment. It is the positive conviction that things are right as they are and must not be changed. The Taurus native is therefore always on his guard against influences which make for so-called reform. His mental attitude is like that of the landed gentry or the farmers in an old established civilization who, feeling that things have gone pretty well on the whole for centuries, are determined to resist radical interference with them, fearing even a desirable reform lest it should be the thin end of some disastrous wedge. For this reason, the Taurus native is often called stupid, especially by people like the natives of Gemini who can see nothing but the pure logic of the situation. The moral character responds very closely with his physical indications. The degraded Taurus type is extraordinarily lazy, sensual, and self-indulgent. Even its affection may be a form of debauch, and the mother who spoils her child by overindulgence is showing the worst qualities of Taurus. The tendency in Taurus to overindulge in the appetite is correlated with the Taurian influence over the throat, which contains the palate. Even the sensual excesses that sometimes are characteristic of the lower type in the sign are likely to be the results of too free dining and whining. In all forms of unrestrained appetite, there is more regard for quantity than for quality. And that's what I got. Well, Taurus is ruled by the planet Venus, and I think that, I've said that, but really need to look at where your Venus is, because your Venus will show you your what, how, where, and why we love people and things on this earth when we're dealing with Taurus. Our rooting or our physicalness of life. Venus is a deeply creating energy and values connection both earthly, earthly and outwardly. Social urges, our art and beauty, creation, attraction, love, our personal magnetism, money, nurturing, motherly love, our sensuality, our bonding energy. Harmony and merging. So Taurus and Venus in the house of resources and resourcefulness. Your self-esteem is here as well. The what, how, where, and why of what we value. The physical things of our, you know, all of our valuables is the second house. Material security, attitude towards possessions. It's below the horizon within the natal chart and those houses one through six deal mostly with our early life and our inner childhood and our inner imprintings our formative lessons experiences roots the fourth house of cancer home is where these areas of maturation are not fully seen and realized until we grow up and connect with others which is in the seventh house so you've got this 
second, fourth, seventh in relationships, you really got this early learning to things. So if someone's a hoarder or someone has issues with money, often you're going to see this um, having some kind of aspect to that second house because it has to do with what we love. And I have come across, like you stated, that in the lower expression, they can be very lazy and sensual and kind of be like the lion, Leo, laying around. Mm. They have that quality, that fixed, fixed, right? Think of a Scorpio. Scorpios are fixed and they just can sometimes go in too long on something. Man, have I been guilty of that. I have you know, really have and I've tried to deal with the shadow on that. But Scorpio is a whole other animal. Um, yeah, anything else you want to say there about our wonderful, wonderful Tauruses? No. Well, the associated cards are the Hierophant. Well, yes. Yeah, I have that next. Five of Pentacles, I think, shows Taurus and lower polarity so well. Six of Pentacles, Seven of Pentacles, and King. So, yeah. Uh, talk to us about the Hierophant. So, the Hierophant, generally associated with a spiritual impulse, help from above. Now, as we've been talking about, that might seem contradictory because the common thought is that Earth is away from spirit, and Hierophant is, of course, the card of Taurus, fixed Earth. But that's not really true. You know, matter is condensed spirit, right? Physicality propels us to spirit. I would still be an atheist personally if it wasn't for drugs, a physical thing. It's the other end of the battery, and the whole thing falls apart without both terminals. I can understand what you're saying there. So I'm going to continue from understanding the Thoth Tarot. So, this card is so rich in traditional anthelmic symbolism that it is difficult to know where to begin. One thing is immediately obvious. This is not your Aeon of Osiris Pope. This card is presented as the Shrine of the Hierophant of the Aeon of Horus. And uh, apparently, this guy has some sex appeal, which I, I never understood that part. It, it seems kind of like a weird old man to me. But anyway, instead of the pale, humorless features of a delicate prelate officiating at some denture worship service, the uh, demure worship service, we are thrilled by the bold, confident image of a Babylonian priest king, an initiator in every sense of the word. He's not humbly served by docile acolytes like the Osirian Hierophant. Instead, he is actively supported in his work by his sword-bearing scarlet woman, the embodiment of heavenly Venus who rules Taurus. Let the woman be girt with a sword before me, the Book of the Law commands. This woman, Crowley states, represents Venus as she now is in the new Aeon, no longer the mere vehicle of her male counterpart, but armed and militant. She carries the moon, which is exalted in the sign of Taurus. Moreover, we see the evidence of this new initiatory love relationship dramatically highlighted in the ornate window that illuminates the shrine, which Crowley describes thus. This symbolism is further carried out in the aureole, where behind the phallic headdress, the rose of five petals is in blossom. The symbolism of the snake and dove refers to this verse of the Book of the Law, chapter 1, verse 57. There are love and love. There is dove and there is the serpent. The window is held in place by nine nails, the number nine being symbolic of the ninth sephira yasad, the sphere of the moon. The Hierophant's shrine is guarded, as every good shrine should be, by the four Karubic beasts. All this new Aeon imagery is wonderful, but what should we keep foremost in our minds is the fact that the Hierophant is the vow of the Yadhe Vahe, the Y-H-V-H, 
he is the six of the divine macrocosmic consciousness to whom we must nail the five of our earthly microcosmic consciousness. He is the Prince Charming in the cosmic fairy tale, our holy guardian angel, the initiatory level characterized by the knowledge and conversation with the holy and guardian angel is illustrated on this card by the union of the pentagram and the hexagram. Our microcosmic self is the dancing child in the pentagram upon the hierophant's macrocosmic breast. The hexagram can be seen enclosing the whole body of the hierophant. And this whole identifying the microcosm with the macrocosm, one of the main teachings in the when you're studying the Kabbalistic tree of life is that the tree is both a map of the universe and a map of yourself. Right? As above, so below. And that's what I have on that. Right on. Yeah, this is from, to just piggyback on that, Tarot of the Spirit, Pamela Eakins, Ph.D., says this of the Hierophant. And um, she goes into the esoteric qualities in a way that I haven't seen other people do. And I can really appreciate it. And it's interesting how, you know, when I started, uh, we started just connecting online, I was studying the Tree of Life and, you know, your a student of it, where you're past just the initiation of the tree of life, you've become pretty pretty serious about understanding it and applying it to daily life, and especially through the Tarot. The Hebrew at attribution is Vav, and it does mean the nail. It's Taurus, which is loyalty and patience. Taurus rules fixed earth. Taurus's planet is Venus, which gives us a very good idea about what is on Taurus's mind in the second house. It is the 16th path, which mediates between Chakma, the eternal father principle, and Shesed, the universal principle of production. I believe you alluded to that. Essence, the connection with the one eternal light, the voice in the inner ear, which tells the nature of the substance which bonds together the pieces of the fabric of existence. This is where we often see in the Tarot when it's discussed the Hierophant as a teacher, someone who is a healer, someone who is very, very deeply connected to Earth, has knowledge of Earth, knows about Earth systems, is conscientious about them and bears responsibility, feels a weight with the fixed Earth, feels a weight upon himself. Um, intelligence, the triumphant, eternal intelligence accessible to the inner self, which is what you just said, as above, so below. So it's this, uh, the Hierophant has this knowledge and this wisdom of above, and in the classical Tarot, we see him seated in a chair, with a robe on, and we see two uh, initiates or two priests, as you would say, in front of him, learning. And this represents the seventh chakra. Here we have the knowledge from above. It is the top crown chakra. It is the information that wants to come in. And there's keys on the card in the traditional tarot um, that sit crossed. And those keys always represent, whenever you see them in the Tarot or anywhere else, that symbol has to do with knowledge and doors and things that can be opened, whether they be doors or your own soul or your own understanding. The Hierophant represents secret, esoteric knowledge. That's what cross keys mean. I did not know that until I started studying uh, those keys. It's interesting, when I was just doing journaling when I was doing my microdosing and experimenting with medicinal mushrooms to do my own shadow work and just tap in. It was interesting that I journaled, uh, find the keys that open the doors, look for the keys. And keys have come to me in such symbolic ways. It's crazy. And here's yet another example of keys coming to me and saying, look, there's keys out there and these keys will turn right. doors that needed to be turned. 
And I can appreciate this card. With what we know about Hakate, of course, that's her symbol. And she keeps the keys to many things, but the most popular is the abyss. She is the one who helps you through the abyss. Those are the cross keys to the darkness, but you come out with knowledge. She will bring you to the death card, Pluto and Scorpio itself, to annihilate you and sit with you and watch while it happens because she knows you must do the shadow work to elevate and then to integrate to above um, we can't stay so fixed on earth we must have the base we must have the teacher we must have the knowledge we must have a system and a way of understanding that can help us access that which is above and it doesn't you know what I love about the tarot is that they're not any denomination or any type of religion or, or anything out there or any group there it's neutral information apply it as you will but there's a veil here that is discussed in this card and the scriptures are truth and must not be altered interpreting such works remains the province of experts and that's what a veil represents so this doesn't is this just isn't any basic knowledge those that operate in this archetype or feel very strongly connected Tauruses that um, have planets that are not debilitated, helping them with their inner planets um, to succeed, will find that often, you know, they understand the need to share yeah. this information. That's also why I really appreciate the uh, esoteric knowledge put into poetic form, like uh, a lot of Greek and Indian mm-hmm. texts. And the idea is in the original language, you can't change one syllable of the poem like for an erroneous reason like you know without it being obvious that it's changed because the rhythm flows it has to rhyme like that's a very clever way to spread esoteric knowledge in a poem because it's very hard to change the original message and have it still make sense and sound good yeah I've never heard that that's thanks for sharing that uh, the mystery here is as sharp nails fasten, you talked about nails in the house of Beth. They fasten the house of Beth. The bonds of love fasten the universe. She interprets it this way. The Hierophant is the inner teacher. He is the message of the higher self or the perception of higher consciousness. This is because he is the direct reflection of pure spiritual being. To perceive his existence within the self is to understand the glory of living in the light. Now, it's interesting. You know, the Hierophant's connected deeply to Earth. This is Earth energy. It's fixed. It's the second house. We know the second house has to do with our resources. Venus is involved here. Money is involved here. Things that we love are involved here. Uh, The second house is a very personal, personal house. Financial standing your inner peace of mind in the manner in which a person meets their obligations is covered in the second house. Survival itself is in the second house. The Hierophant is the revelation of the inner voice or the flash of insight that comes when least expected. He is the inner nudge or direct first-hand experience, be it intellectual spiritual, emotional, or physical that guides you on your path through life. This flash, which lets you know what you should be doing, may come in the form of a twinge in the stomach, a tightening of the throat, a pang in the heart. Synchronicities. Obviously, this is something I have and I know that I'm on the right path. Look for for repeating numbers and and they will guide you. They're, They're trying to direct you. It may come in the form of a sudden, unexpected surge of joy or a tear that leads to the eye. The Hierophant is speaking when you are thinking, hey, I love this place. Or how am I going to get out of here? So it's helping you intuitively connect to Earth and intuitively go above to Earth or survive to to get the higher knowledge. It's very personal. Um... I don't pull the Hierophant a lot in my readings. It's just not a card that comes out that often. 
Um, but when it does, I sit back and listen because after all, it does reduce to the number five, right? Or it is five itself, excuse me. And those are challenge numbers. Uh, the Tarot would say here, you know, you've got some further growing to do. This is why the teacher has shown up. And it's this initial struggle onto a new path. It's um, just equilibrium, number five. Shakes things up. Thank you, Uranus. Breaking old habits. Passing through fire to be made stronger. This is the throat chakra. So again, the teacher, where we speak, where our words come out of uh, our mouth. So that's all I have on the Hierophant that I wanted to share. Well, that's, thank you. That was wonderful. Now we continue our last uh, sign, Virgo. Uh, lovely Virgo. Lovely, lovely Virgo. Tell you what, Virgo's no joke. You want to lead out on that or you want me to lead out on that? You should start. I should start? Okay. Yeah. Well, to know Virgo is to know its planet. And I think that that's really, really huge to bring Mercury into here. Because this is the link of the mind when we think of Mercury. And the one that wishes androgynously to communicate. We've gone over Mercury quite a bit in our podcast. So if you follow us, you should have... A pretty good grasp but where the masculine sun rules spirit the positive polarity the feminine moon rules form the negative polarity androgynous mercury rules the reasoning mind and it's the link between spirit and form and is the messenger of the gods now Virgo shows up with mercury as its ruler in the sixth house in the, the sixth house Mercury, excuse me, Virgo is mutable Earth. So now we've got a little bit different type of uh, movement here that we haven't discussed yet. And when something is mutable, it can be changed. It can be moved. It can be mixed. Um, think of... I thought of as... Yeah. Sorry, uh hermaphroditic as of rather than masculine or feminine yeah there's like flexibility the androgynous exactly. there's pliability adaptability to circumstances um, there can be easygoing tolerant and free flow free flowing uh, with mutable signs um, mutable signs uh, are good imitators and can give things a new slant on a new angle um, I don't have a lot of mutable signs in my own personal chart. I have mostly fixed and cardinal. So, and it makes sense because I tend to be, you know, I kind of know where I'm going and what I'm doing and I'm not really that flexible. And it has been a challenge and something that, you know, I have learned to to wrap my head around <laughs> and, and be like, no, you need to be more flexible. You need to be more bending and yielding. So... Ruled by Mercury, it's a feminine receptive sign. And you're looking at August 21st to September 22nd if you're Virgo. And Virgo represents the harvest time. Within the natal chart, this is the gleaning of the wheat, so to speak. All the bounty and the fruits of the earth by the time we get towards the end of August. Everything is reaping, being reaped, excuse me, in full bounty and coming in. Keyword for Virgo is I analyze. Rules the assimilative system in the physical body. And Virgo is depicted as a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. And the symbol indicates the gathering in of material needs just as Virgo people collect, digest, and correlate facts for their mental values. Now I can't even tell you how true that is about Virgos. These are the researchers of the world. The ones that will stay on something like Scorpio, a lot like Scorpio, but in a different way. Um, there's a purity and a perfection that goes on here with Virgos. That you can see um, with, with Mercury being the ruler, this is where we can see OCD issues. Um, people that are mm. challenged with their mind to perfectionists where it's like they have to rearrange their cupboards every day. 
things like this or something falls out of line, it, it can really disturb the equilibrium of the person himself, herself, itself, androgynous, right? Um, they, this is where you can find that Virgos can be, can be fault-finding. Uh, they can be highly so critical that they're so discriminatory that they just chop, chop, chop down at everything. I have a stellum in Virgo in my 10th house, in Pluto, Uranus, and Mars. So, you know, it's basically Uranus is an astrologer, and Pluto is a psychologist sitting in the 10th house. Virgo has really helped me stay the course. So I, I, I really appreciate Virgo a lot. You know, despite Virgo's ruling the daily house, sixth house of, excuse me, daily activities, what you do during the day, what you do with your hands, um, besides all that, Virgos can really feel uh, inadequate. And they can feel, this is one of the signs that struggles with this, that they just don't think like they measure up. They're so critical that it can turn inward. And it can get, not just express out, but in, and then that can cause all kinds of problems. So, um, what has been your experience with your Virgo, and what do you have to share on Virgo? Well, personally, my Mercury is in Virgo, so... You know, that has benefits. I mean, it's hard to talk about it without sounding too full of myself, but right, I mean, I'm right. sure you could tell I'm not stupid. Right. But, right. Um, this is intelligent. There's something, yeah. there's something I just put together now when you mentioned this symbol of Virgo, the Virgin. We talked about, I think it was the moon episode, or maybe Venus, uh, what it actually means when we say that a goddess is a virgin in mythology and yeah. anything when we're talking about these things. And we came away with the idea that the virgin is more focused on herself, right? Because she doesn't have a husband or kids. And that makes a lot of sense when we consider the tarot card for Virgo, the hermit. Right. But we're going to get to that in a little bit. First, I have a little bit from Your Place in the Sun. On Virgo. Mercury being so strong in this sign, there is a great similarity between it and Gemini in the matter of mentality, but the earthiness of Virgo diminishes the pure rationality of this native, and his reasoning powers are not valued for their own sake, as we found to be the case with the more positive mercurial sign. The Virgo native is extremely practical and his aims are usually influenced by some so-called material advantage. His outlook is apt to be petty and his, reason, and his reason itself hampered by the perpetual intrusion of the pragmatic viewpoint. He is therefore practically incapable of producing anything with the fire of true genius and however talented he may be, it is difficult to conceal the fact that he has an axe to grind. Uh, the practicality of Virgo and its love of order and arrangement, its patience and foresight give it a regard for the conventions of life, which may seem easily be mistaken for an ethical morality that the sign itself does not possess. The tendency with Virgo is to talk about ethics instead of feeling it in itself what is right and what is wrong. Every fact of nature is a basis for its investigation, but the fact is always observed from the outside, and so never really understood. The Virgo type of reformer is a hopeless doctrinaire. He works out by mathematics what is best for everybody and is simply annoyed at the stupidity of people who passionately attack his proposals as, a, as callous and immoral. And that's very common with people with a lot of mercurial, airy energy people who are using all hod and no net satch Venus, mm -hmm. you know, only intellect and logic and right. no emotions. I mean, that's how you get now you're gonna like that's how you get people, you know, logically reasoning out that they should murder a million people. I mean, that's how you get those kind of events when you have 
all logic and earth and intellect and no emotion, no netzach, no intuition. Mm-hmm. And you can have too much intuition and no logic. There's, right. again, this balance, balance we need right. to find on Earth. And we find in the excesses, this is where we find um, the times of our lives that probably weren't the best. Although, um, it depends on the situation. I guess I should clarify that, you know, because sometimes I know the moments that when I was working with the plant medicine, I thought I was going to die at times. But it was a death that I needed to experience. It wasn't a literal death. It wasn't the best. Like overdosing. These are pure plants. This has been been medicinal mushrooms have been used for eons. You know, wake up, world. Wake the up. only way to be reborn is to wake die. Up. We have to wake up to the power of plant medicine. Just a huge plug for it here. Um, I, it's saying that with understanding that sidebar here, control conditions, set and setting, you know, be in the right situation, the right frame of mind, have your health together, you know, go into these things with with a handle in your hand and, you know, a bag of weed and a bunch of coke, you know, I mean, you want to go and have pure experience and be in the best possible mindset so that you can receive and heal, because I think that's what they're meant for, for us to reconnect us to all that is. And then just to go in and, you know, really do that deep shadow work. Um, I think that's what they're there for. Hell yeah. And, and Virgo would say yes. You know, 10th house Virgo would say yes. You know, new medicine, new new way of, of healing, new way of, of using our hands, and new, new, new methods of, of wellness. No doubt about it. I wanted to read something on Mercury here real quick because it's right online what you were saying, in uh, the book A Cosmic Science by Isabel Hickey, planet of consciousness, messenger between heaven and earth. Why is Mercury in its detriment in Sagittarius? There is a mystery hidden here, and it is one of the secrets hidden in initiation. Mercury rules the dual sign, Gemini, but in the sign of the universal mind, there is no duality. Gemini uh, rules the third house and Sagittarius rules the ninth. All is truly one in the ninth house. When the link is made between the universal self and the personality, then truly I and my father are one, in quotes, and the mind and we know it no longer operates. This is a clue to the reason why Mercury is in its fall in Pisces. The critical analyzing Mercury must be dissolved in the love and compassion of Pisces. When this is so, man needs no mediator, but deals directly with his emanating source. For the uninvolved soul, Mercury in Pisces sensitizes him first to his own suffering and then to the suffering of others. Doubt and depression are his greatest enemies. I thought that was pretty interesting. Yep, because that makes a whole ton of sense. It does, and this is where we must look at, right. you know, just because you have a sign somewhere, is it debilitated? How is it functioning? What are the other mm. aspects, what are the other angles and aspects communicating through other positions in the chart back to Mercury? What's Mercury sending out? Um, this is why we can't just do pat psychology where you're just laying simple answers down. We must consider the whole chart. We're being very general. Uh, there's so much more that could be said, but we're trying to just get interest flowing on these individual signs and individual elements and the planets to hope that it'll lead you down a path where you do your own self-discovery and right. grow and learn. And that makes a lot of sense with Mercury being a detriment in those two signs. If you just imagine the energies Right, because Sagittarian people are very extroverted, the outgoing, social, charismatic, and people with heavy Mercury energy are the exact opposite. They're more introverted in towards the self, you know, the, the hermit, not overthinking everything, analyzing everything. You know, that's mm -hmm. not how you socialize. And with Pisces, also very 
mercurial intellectual people are very likely to lack faith. I mean, I struggle with this myself. It's hard to just like believe things are going to work out and believe in things that you can't exactly measure all the time, but it it's definitely a weak point for me. So those two things make a lot of sense if you just, you know, consider the energies Absolutely, and especially if you have Mercury in Virgo. <laughs> yeah. She goes on, Mercury in Aquarius is its best position for an earthling. And Mercury in Virgo is the secondary place. Uranus, higher octave, O-C-T-A-V-E, by the way, of Mercury, <laughs> you'd have to hear our other podcast to get that, lends intuitiveness to the intellectual gifts of Mercury. Here, the mind is not fogged up by emotion. Mercury in Virgo gives a practical, common sense to the airness, airiness, pardon me, of Mercury. Mercury in Leo is in its fall. The mind is dissolved in the light of the spirit, the sun. On the personal level, the ego must be dissolved and vanity and pride must depart. Uh, Virgo... Virgo really wants to, wants to, at the end of the day, with, with Mercury and its intelligence, wants to really get the point across, wants it to be clear, wants it to be clean, wants it to be crisp, doesn't like a lot of fluff about it, doesn't need a bunch, doesn't need a big pitch for it to walk out on stage, doesn't need to be pumped up, it just wants to give the information. That's the way I see. And when you look at the hermit, that's exactly what we have going on there. Did you want to jump into... The Tarot? Yes. Hermit. So. Number nine. Powerful number. Here. Again, I'll let you from open up. Yep. the Hermit, as we've just been talking about, there is definitely an influence the mercurial influence in Virgo that tends to make one go inward, right? To focus on the self, to self-analyze, to take that journey into yourself, to understand thyself, know thyself, and all that. Absolutely. So, there's a little bit from understanding the Thoth Tarot. By now, you're probably tired of hearing me talk about the special virtues inherent in the element Earth. You probably think you've heard enough about how humble Earth is uniquely connected to spirit and how it helps regenerate the highest high because of the simple fact that it is the lowest of the low. See chapter 11. Well, get ready to hear some more, because we're not through yet. As a matter of fact, in the pages that follow, you are going to get some pretty big doses of this doctrinal medicine that Crowley calls the climax of the, of the descent into matter. Why is it so important for you to keep taking this medicine? First of all, because it will help you understand the living nature of tarot. More important, however, because you are the grand climax of the descent into matter. I have tried to organize the material of this book so that by the time you read about the last card of the tarot, the ten of discs, which we will get to, you will be armed with enough occult knowledge to comprehend the great magic that takes place there. It is a process that Crowley calls the mode of fulfillment of the great work. I'm sure you wouldn't do this, but if you were to turn to the back of the book and read what I have written about the ten of discs, you would learn albeit prematurely, that the three cosmic players which are responsible for creating that mode of fulfillment of the great work are Earth, Mercury, and the Sun. That shouldn't surprise you, really, after all. Earth is that special, lowest of the low element you're getting so tired of hearing about. Tarot is the province of Thoth, Mercury, and the Sun is the secret seed of universal life that we knew was going to be so important since we first saw it radiating in front of the fool's groin. Earth, Mercury, and the Sun have their first important strategy meeting in Key 9, the Hermit. Just look at how Earth, Mercury, and the Sun come together in the Hermit. He represents the zodiac sign of Virgo. Virgo is the immutable sign of Earth. 
Virgo is ruled by Mercury, and Mercury is exalted in Virgo. The hermit carries the lamp of the sun, which he gives his light to the world. It's as simple as that. We've met the hermit once before as a hooded figure that officiates the royal wedding in Key 6, the lovers. And while he is sexually ambivalent, he is indeed a he and an important expression of male creative energy. The Hebrew letter sacred to Virgo and the hermit is Yod, the tenth letter and the first supreme letter in the yod He vod He. In a very real way, the tiny flame of Yod is the fundamental Hebrew letter. All the other letters are created from this basic form. As a hidden seed of the Hebrew alphabet, Yod also symbolizes the mystery of the sperm, the hidden seed, and the central secret of fertilization. See how the hermit stares at the Orphic egg? If I were that egg, I'd be nervous, Crowley writes. In this trump is shown the entire mystery of life in its most secret workings. And that's what I have on that. This is from Living the Kabbalistic Tarot, Amber Jayanti. Page 136, I do not own this information, just like the other stuff I quoted as well. I think that's important to say that. I appreciate all the work that's gone before me, and I want to I want to give it credit. I don't want to be found you know, saying things that, that aren't my own and taking credit for them. Um, she says this, The hermit is associated with the color yellow-green, the herb licorice, and the musical note F. The hermit's Hebrew name, Yad, means an open, creative, or helping hand. This brings to mind ideas of giving and receiving Mercury, right? Merchant, Mercurial, Mercury. Reciprocal action. Pardon me? Hermaphroditic, yeah, androgynous. Right. Right. Reciprocal action. Remember, when you are receptive, you give another the opportunity to show affection and thoughtfulness. Notice how the hermit's cap is shaped like the letter to remind us that he directs his mental attention to the highest service. Our hands and bodies serve our mind and heart, but in time, our hands, mind, and heart, just like the three planets you were just talking about, our, our um, hands, mind, and heart learn to consciously serve the spirit. Therefore, everything we do in life can be looked upon as service to the higher self. Recalling this in the midst of daily living definitely makes its sameness more palatable. Buddhists refer to this attitude as the one taste. Yogists relate it as guru seva, service to the highest teacher. And Western mysticism identifies this concept as the dedication of one's actions and the fruits thereof to God deaths, higher self, and the benefit of divinity embodied in humanity and nature. Divinity embodied in humanity and nature. Nature is earth. Divinity lives in earth. It is all up in there. And when we tap into earth, we tap into the divine. And it shows itself reveals itself. There's a verse out of scripture uh, that Paul spoke of, the Apostle Paul, and he said, basically relating to how he believed God was revealing himself through creation, through the things that have been made. So, you know, noticing that, look, there's, there's patterns, and there's living, and then there's death, and there's change, and there's cycles. Look at earth. You know, look at how it mimics our own lives and our own cycles. And how we're connected. So if you live here on earth and you're really having a hard time connecting, you know, take a look at some of these archetypes. And sit with them. And study them. And they'll guide you. And they'll help you see um, a practical way. You look at Taurus being earth. I mean, he is all up on the ground living this practicable life. Definitely heavenward, but planted, rooted on the ground, very sensual, very sensuous, very feeling, very touching, you know, we went into Taurus, but you you can't miss that point, 
You know what I'm saying with Earth? Yeah. It's, it's yeah, that's an that's interesting. You mentioned the senses, or made me think of the Buddhist meditation technique of only paying attention through to what comes through your five senses and nothing else. Just mm. to get yourself in that mode of thought as very mm -hmm. Torian. Yeah. Or uh, Virgo, I mean, rather. Wanted to talk for a minute about the uh, the other cards involved um, with... Um, yes, yeah, so I, I definitely with, wanted to mention Virgo. the Ten of Discs and the yep. Princess of Discs. I have the... And they're all very practical cards because they're Earth. But I have the Eight of Pentacles which, of course, is Sun in Virgo. Eight. Well, that um, makes sense, because eight yeah. is hot, the sphere right. of Mercury. Right. The nine of pentacles is Venus. How lovely in Virgo. If that is not a perfect picture, I love that card. I draw it all the time. I draw this card all the time. She's always coming to me. This is the woman working... Uh, a solo on her own and the bird there showing messages is a very deep card a lot of symbolism Venus draped all over her robe in the traditional how does that the Thoth duck well you're going to go into that aren't you and then you said the ten of disc um, the ten, yeah ten of, ten of discs disc. and the princess of discs yeah ten of disc I've got Mercury in Virgo look at you so you're going to yeah. have all that earthly manifestation Anthony you bet you are I fucking hope it gets here soon because I got the Knight of Earth Pentacles. Is fucking killing me. <laughs> I know it is. We're dying. Well, I was talking to Anthony. We've been trying to get this done, which you've alluded to, and he said, "I just want to get Earth done, Kate." <laughs> you can feel it, man, when you said it. Like, no, I just want to get Earth done. <laughs> I really need really to move on from this shit. <laughs> when What's we're that? studying. The energy really does come to us you know, in it between does. episodes when we're studying to it. If you decide you're going to tell the world about Earth, Earth will show up and tell yeah. you all about itself. You and sure it won't will. go away until you get no. the fucking episode out. It has been so helpful for me, Anthony, to have this Earth experience. And I found myself in gratitude today over everything because I know we've really talked a lot about it it's the challenges that we've had you know things that are really out of our own hands the things that are coming to us just things around us <laughs> but uh, yeah I'll send it back over to you I just wanted to share those other cards I know you're going to go into them a little deeper so you should do the the eight and the nine of discs first because then I have the ten of discs okay I can do that all right well the eight of discs of course traditionally shows a gentleman or a woman, I guess it'd be a female, a, a person, probably androgynous, right? A person sitting down and just chipping away at his disc, her disc, sitting on a bench, and uh, the colors are phenomenal. There, I did want to say you mentioned the sun a lot, and and you know all the discs are bright yellow, um, bringing in the sun, especially the nine, um, bringing in the sun. But it's this is meaningful work. The eight of pentacles, Virgo. This is precision too, because it's got them all lined up. You know, just working on another one. They all look the same, and, and there's commitment here. There's stocking up, and there's repetition taking place with um, the expression of this card. So when it appears in a reading, speaking about focused and satisfying work, that maybe, depending on what you've asked, you know, this is what you should do or you're going to be employed soon doing it, or find something that makes your heart come alive is what I share with people. You know, what makes your heart come alive? Do that. If this person isn't in any stress or any anxiety. They're away from the city. In fact, it looks like they have a little smile on their face, just really enjoying what they're doing. And this individual is dressed in a blue shirt, indicating uh, intuition and the subconscious in water. Black is mystery. And then he has red tights. Red tights indicating passion and rootedness. His legs are firmly sitting, rooted, connected to his brown shoes, connected to earth. And, and the result is a uh, product. The result is look at all these um, achievements lined up that he has done. Did you want to say anything about eight? Or one and nine? Sure. I mean, I didn't, I didn't uh, prepare anything on eight, but generally, 
um, now that I'm looking at it on the Thoth deck, just to describe it, it's a tree with eight flowers. And it is very much the same, uh, the fruits of your labor vibe, but the the title is Prudence. And mm-hmm. the card as a whole, especially with Earth, uh, you know, of course, being a disc card and Virgo and all that, it it notifies, signifies a slow process. It's not an instant gain kind of thing, of course. The tree takes a while to fruit and you have to work at it, but then, you know, the fruits of your labor are worth it. That's the only thing I would have to add is the uh, slowness of, you know, the energy in this card. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Very methodical, right? Yeah. And that is Virgo all the way. You know, they do make the best researchers. They can make good surgeons as well. Dealing with the hands, daily life, we see good surgeons with Virgo brain surgeons. Uh, Mercury, the mind, communication. Nine of Pentacles, that was Virgo and Venus. And, of course, that's Earth, as we're talking about. And I wanted to mention this bird that's perched on her arm as she's in her garden around her discs that are all laid to her sides, one on one side, one on the other. And, you know, I did come across why they're stacked that way, and there was three on the right as you're facing it and five on the left, uh, excuse me, six on the left, and I don't remember what it was, And but there's a reason for that, the way that they're laying. Um, everything is very important in, in the tarot. The way that everything is laid has meaning. But birds are messengers. Whenever you see them, if you see, so the Native Americans believe you see a feather, you know, Indian would say that it's a bird is communicating to you. This is a message. This message is coming to you. They represent clear thought and speech, birds. And they are associated with intellect and freedom. That's really, really important. And so the nine of Pentacles is the woman experiencing her freedom out in her woods. She this is considered to be the female entrepreneur card. You know, self sufficiency is that player here. Discipline again and earning rewards, earning fruit, you know, gaining fruit for her labors. Um, and she got that way because she works hard. She has a work ethic. So Venus here of course is about money and possessions and all of that and communication. So the throat chakra is here with, with Taurus and Libra, um, air. But it's also about um, relationships. And if she has this Venus draped all over her and she's in a garden by herself, this card always shows me that there's not anyone else in this card, that she knows who she is. There's an internal relationship taking place there. Because she looks very regal as she stands in her garden um, and quite unpressured and very calm and uh, seems just to be very, very content. So you also, you know, if you pull this card, it can come across with that Virgoic kind of pride that they can get. Not like a Leo pride. It's in a diff- It's an intellectual pride like... I don't really need you. You know, I have everything I need. And these are the kind of people that really, they really do need someone, but they just don't say it. They're, they're more loners. That makes sense. Do you want to add anything on the nine? Uh, the only two things that I would add is that aside from everything else you mentioned about Venus, Venus is also, when I see Venus showing up in an Earth card, or with masculine energies, I see that as a reminder of you can't get everything done through force and matter alone. You know, sometimes things take charm. Sometimes things take a bit of a feminine touch. You know, you can't just solve everything with matter and earth and forcing things into place. And also nine makes it uh, takes place on the sphere called Yasad on the Tree of Life, yeah. which is the sphere of the moon. And it's the second to last sphere, meaning it is the closest to Earth other than Malkuth. Right? So it's also it's nearing the end of a very 
long process, much like the eight of discs is. Right. Yeah, and, you know, there's a snail crawling out in front of her, showing, you know, this is a long, slow journey, but snails carry their homes on their backs, so it's also a symbol of self-sufficiency. So it's the feminine, the feminine being secure in herself, because, you know, Virgo is feminine. This is a very, very strong feminine, self-reliant energy from this card. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. That's so, all I got on that. So the, about the Ten of Discs, I think it's important to look at the Ten of Discs and the Princess of Discs because they are some the earthiest of the earth, right? Ten of mm-hmm. Discs, Ten being Malkuth, which is the sphere of earth. Yeah. Right, and Princess of Discs is the Earth of Earth. Right. I think it, studying these cards really helps illustrate the virtues of Earth in general, the importance of the physical plane being the turning point, you know, the climax of the fool's journey. Right. Once the fool goes from the top of the tree to the bottom, really that's just a turning point. Now that's you being born on Earth trying to find your way back to the top of the tree. So, the Ten of Discs called Wealth from Understanding Doth Tarot. The Ten of Discs represents the climax of the descent into matter and is the signal for the redintegration by spirit. And actually, I'm going to stop there and talk about that word, redintegration, because I thought it was some kind of typo at first. Not, it is not reintegration, it's re Dintegration. Uh, so I looked at the definitions, multiple definitions for redintegration. This is from the Merriam Webster, Webster Dictionary. Restoration to a former state. The action of reorganizing psychological processes once they've been disorganized by mental dysfunction, especially in psychoses also refers in general to restoration to wellness, typical condition, or performance. See, we are Alice that fell down the rabbit hole. Right. 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 Our redintegration to spirit is climbing out of that rabbit hole, finding your way from Malkuth back to Kether. So, continuing. Crowley calls this card a hieroglyph of the cycle of regeneration. It is, after all, the last tarot card. It represents the lowest sphere, Malkuth Earth, of the lowest Kabbalistic world, Asaya, the material plane. The tens of the other suits have somewhere to go. They simply cooperate with gravity and degenerate into the next lower suit. For the ten of discs, there is no place to descend, no place to grow, no place to go. The ten of discs is forced to do something that no other small card is called upon to do. From its position at the bottom of the cosmos, it has some it has to somehow form a link with the secret of creation, then actually reincarnate fresh and new at the very top of the tarot cycle. That is the true wealth. Mm-hmm. Right, and w- but when you look at the ten of pentacles, it is you know, people get that and they're like they put a really shallow sometimes um, right, definition. Right, the picture is all coins. Yeah, and they just think, oh, I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be wealthy, but they don't understand it's Mercury and Virgo. You're about to roll up those sleeves and work your butt off. You know, Virgo doesn't play. Virgo's mutable, but Virgo is Earth. His intent, her intentions is, is downward more than anything. Yes, the hermit is very strong in drawing down that wisdom from above, but it, the focus is sixth day is sixth house daily life. So um, he didn't just get there. You didn't, you know, you've heard the adage, you, you didn't just uh, land on the top of the mountain. You know, there's a process at play here with Virgo, a methodical, inch by inch, step by step process to get you to this ten, 
And then I love the page or the princess of pentacles. It's a powerful card. People underestimate that card. You pull that card, you know, you're really going to start getting into some work energy with Earth. And that's exciting because this is manifestation land. So Virgo's interested in doing that and bringing, bringing that down in tens, going back to that ten of pentacles. They're the most complete form of the suits in that energy. You know, they're beyond the material, like you just said. It's really good to point that out. They're beyond the nines. They're, they're beyond the material completion of the nines. Ten signify ultimate transcendental completion. It's a time where mastery has been achieved. Um, but sometimes you can have too much and you take it for granted, which is also indicated if you reverse this card, right? And you can feel stagnated. So remember these cards... They all turn around and they can be reversed. And it's important to learn those meanings too. And this is where we have our excesses, right? But ten, course, tens uh, are associated with the Wheel of Fortune too. So um, it reduces to a one. We need to bring it down to that common denominator. And one is the seed, isn't it? And it holds potential for new growth. So when you see tens, be looking for the ones. Where am I going? Where's the page or the princess taking me? Mm, very much. So again, the the princess of discs being Earth of Earth. So understanding Thoth's tarot, Law Milo Duquette, as always. As Earth of Earth, she's the lowest court card of the lowest suit. She's the ultimate princess. No, not only is she pregnant with the highest high, lowest low, and everything in between of the suit of discs, she is pregnant with the highest high, lowest low, and everything in between of all the suits. She's the Malkuth of Malkuths and carries within her body the potential of all possible possibilities and the key to perpetuating life in, of the universe. As a priestess of Demeter, she arises in her glory from out of the earth itself and establishes her altar in the midst of a grove of barren and dying trees that her fertile presence will now restore to green health. Her magic wand is a diamond-tipped rod symbolic of the essence of Kether, the highest high and whose tetrahedral form is the basic structure of all carbon-based life. She is wrapped in an enormous cape of what appears to be animal fur and is crowned with the head and horns of a ram. Her disc is a giant seed composed of 36 sections, perhaps suggesting the source of the 36 small cards of the tarot to follow. The general germ of the seed is the Chinese yin yang. Dark yellows and browns radiate a warm and almost humid atmosphere for this card. Textured grays combine to make this card almost tactile. <coughs> As he can uh, as he concludes in his comments on this card in the Book of Thoth, Crowley writes as if he were ending the entire book. In a way, he was, because the Princess of Discs is in many ways the last tarot card. I, too, would like to end our discussion of the court cards with his wonderful of benediction. Let every student of this essay and every end of this book of Tehuti this living book that guides man through all time and leads him to eternity at every page, hold fast the simplest, most far-reaching doctrine in his heart and mind, inflaming the inmost of his being that he also, having explored each recess of the universe, may therein find a light of truth, so come to the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel and accomplish the great work, attain the sun and bottom, true wisdom and perfect happiness. The Page of Pentacles in the Smith deck, Smith Waite, uh, is beautiful. And all pages represent Earth there as well. So we're on the same page. Uh, ha, 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 ha. That was just horrible. <laughs> but I had to say it. Okay, so now you want to go into Malkuth, which is 10. I know that. Yes. So, Malkuth. The ten sphere, the Kabbalistic sphere of life, the sphere of earth. 
So, just from this basic list of associations in the On Fortune's mystical Kabbalah title, The Kingdom, additional titles, The Gate, The Gate of Death, The Gate of the Shadow of Death, The Gate of Tears, The Gate of Justice, The Gate of Prayer, The Gate of the Daughter of the Mighty Ones, The Gate of the Garden of Eden, The Inferior Mother, Malha the Queen, Kala the Bride, the Virgin. Magical image, a young woman crowned and throne. Spiritual experience, vision of the holy guardian angel, virtue, discrimination, vice, avarice, which is greed for material gain, inertia, symbols. The altar of the double cube, the equal armed cross, the magic circle, the triangle of art. The Yetziatric text is as follows. The tenth path is called the resplendent intelligence because it is exalted above the, every head and sits upon the throne of Binah. It illuminates the splendors of all the lights and causes an influence to emanate from the prince of, countenance, of countenances, the angel of Kether. And it's very, when I say physicality is the other end of the battery notice how it says causes an influence to emanate from the prince of countenances the angel of kether that is literally how a battery works the positive charge on the positive end of the battery pulls on the electrons that on the the negatively charged particles on the negative end of the battery. That is exactly how a battery works. And also, hmm. when it says sits upon the throne of Bina, that is the superior mother to Malkuth being called the inferior mother, right? Because Bina is form, but it's not yet matter. Right, they're two different yeah. concepts. Yes. So that's the idea between the superior mother and the inferior mother. Just gonna read a couple passages <coughs> from Dion Fortune's mystical Kabbalah. The esotericist sees in Malkuth the end result of all operations. Not until the pairs of opposites have achieved the settled equilibrium which gives the state of earth or coherence can they be said to have completed any given cycle of experience. When this is achieved, they build a permanent vehicle of manifestation and stereotype its reactions. The machinery of expression thus evolved becomes self-regulating and will continue to function with the minimum of attention, just as the human heart opens and shuts its valves with perfect regularity in response to a stereotype cycle of nervous impulses and the pressure of blood. For while Malkuth is essentially the sphere of form, all coherence of parts save simple mechanical stresses and electromagnetic attractions and repulsions depend on the functions of Yassad. And Yassad, though it is essentially a form-giving sephirah, depends for the manifestation of its activities upon the substance provided by Malkuth. Of course, Yassad is 9, Malkuth is 10, the last two in the process. The forms of Yassad are such stuff as dreams are made on till they have picked up the material particles of Malkuth to body forth their forms. There are systems of stresses into whose framework the physical particles are built. And equally with Malkuth, it is inanimate matter until the powers of Yassad in, in soul. Malkuth is the nadir of evolution, but it should be looked upon not as the ultimate depth of unspirituality, but as the marking buoy in a yacht race. Any yacht that puts about on the homeward course before it has rounded the marking buoy is disqualified, and so it is with the soul. If we try to escape from the discipline of matter before we have mastered the lessons of matter, 
We are not advancing heavenwards, but suffering from arrested development. It is these spiritual detectives who flock from one to another of the innumerable wildcat uplift organizations that come to us from the far east and the far west. They find in cheap idealism an escape from the rigorous demands of life. But this is not a way of advancement, but a way of retreat. Sooner or later, they have to face the fence and clear it. Life brings them up to it again and again, and presently begins to use the whip and spur a psychological sickness. For those who will not face life, dissociate, and dissociation is the prime cause of most of the ills that the that mind is heir to. It is in the sphere of Malkuth that civilization has wrought for the last thousand years. It does not need any astrologer to tell us that the Great War marked the end of an epic. This was written in the 40s. And that we are now in the dawn of a new phase. According to the Kabbalistic doctrine, the lightning flash, having come down the tree till it ends in Malkuth, and is now replaced by the symbolism of the serpent of wisdom, whose coils loop upwards on the path till its head rests beside Kether. The lightning flash represents the unconscious descent of force, building the planes of manifestation, passing from active to passive and back again in order that equilibrium may be maintained. The serpent coiling upon the path represents the dawn of objective consciousness and is the symbol of initiation by the path whereon the initiates have gone. Ahead of their time, evolution is beginning to go, taking with it the race as a whole. It is now becoming normal for the average man to do what only the initiates used to do. That's a lot to chew on right there. Got a little bit more, a couple more paragraphs. Let us now interpret this simile from the point of view of technical occultism. Every magical operation is designed to bring power down the planes into the reach of the operator, who then applies it to whatever ends he may design. Many operators are content if they can obtain purely subjective results, that is to say, a sense of exaltation. Others aim at the, productive, the production of psychic phenomena. It should be recognized, however, that no operation is completed until a process has been expressed in terms of Malkuth, or in other words, has issued forth in action on the physical plane. If this is not done, that force has been generated and is not properly earthed, and it is this loose force left lying around that causes the trouble in magical experiments. It may not cause trouble in a single experiment, as few operators generate enough power to cause anything, let alone trouble. But in a series of experiments, the effect may be cumulative and result in a general psychic upheaval and run of bad luck and queer happenings is so often reported by experimenters. It is these sort of things that give experimental magic a bad name and lead and lead to it being regarded as dangerous and compared to drug addiction. The true analogy, however, would be with the dangers of X-ray research in its early days. It is a faulty technique that, that gives rise to trouble, as it always must when active potencies are being handled. Perfect your technique, and you get rid of your troubles and have a very potent force available for use. Hmm. Skipping forward a bunch of pages... There's so much on this. There's so much yeah. wisdom. This is a paragraph here and there. Now, this is an all-important point when applied to the microcosm, for it teaches us that we need to be in circuit with the earth soul just as much as with the God of heaven. There is an inspiration that rises up from the unconscious quite as much as there is an inspiration that flows down from the superconscious. This comes out clearly in the Greek myths, wherein we find such positive earth forces as Pan, who, by virtue of his goat symbolism, cannot be assigned otherwise than to the sphere of earth. For Capricorn is the most earthy of the earthly triplicity. Pan represents the positive magnetism of the earth uprushing in its return to the All-Father. Ceres, on the other hand, or many-breasted Diana, who are both very earthly Venuses and far from virgin, represent the final earthing of the heavenly force in dense matter. 
Hera, who has been called the Celestial Venus or Heavenly Aphrodite, represents the return of the uprushing Earth force to heaven and, and is Earth positive on a celestial level. Now that's all I got. Yeah, that was, that was excellent. Thank you for sharing that. There's a lot of new information for me that I've, I've never heard before. You know, as you were reading it, and I was taking it in, and I, I was hearing the word grounding, grounding, like Earth is where we manifest. I figured that out. But it's also where we can go for our help. Like Earth will ground you. What does that mean? It's it's more than just sitting on your bed in your room, chanting. It, although it can take place that way because you can really move yourself out of your body into Earth. But what I'm saying is, it's physically walking barefoot on the Earth. It's sitting, just sitting upon the Earth. It's being in Earth. Earth, being in nature, not in concrete and in cubicles and fluorescent lights for hours and hours in, a, in an office. I think we're seeing, I don't want to go into it, but tor North Node in Taurus, this has been the theme, we're shifting and changing the things we love on a daily basis. Second house, Taurus, Earth, working with other Earth energy, Virgo, daily basis, and then 10th house, it's coming out in our careers where people are, no, I, I can work from home. You know, I don't need to go to a high-rise. I don't need to own a big office building. I can do this from my home. And they're learning this. And we're seeing this shift and this changing. But um, we must connect ourselves and ground. And we also can use tones to ground us and herbs to ground us and crystals to ground us, meditations, things that Earth has made and given us and provided for us to burn, digest, uh, visualize, work with and use in a grounded manner. And, but the thing is, I'm one of those people, I have Uranus on my midheaven, which is the top of your chart. <laughs> a tough place for that planet to be, but it's the rebel at heart. And, and it's a place that's very visible. So Uranus is all about, look, I'll try that. I mean, the fool is Uranus, right? We talked about this. <laughs> Uh, go listen to the fool. Uh, let's talk about the fool in the Planet Uranus episode. Um, this is where you're willing to take chances. And, and you do have the accesses, but you learn from them. And we can't run from Earth and so separate ourselves from it because we have to live here. I don't think we should worship it and go way off that direction. That's just me. I tend to be more of a balance in the middle. But I've had my accesses and I don't regret them is what I'm saying. Um, oh, because boy, life lived in the middle is fucking boring. It is. It is. It's not where it's not it's not where you're going to see anything really out of the ordinary in your life occur because you're going to just stay there all the time. If you want those moments of deep change and deep reflection and aha moments and how about heartache? You know, I mean, even heartache or really bad or poor decisions, things that you did and that you're like, boy, you know, I, I could have made a better decision there. All of that. I put, I put your heart only hurt so much because of how I love you were. I mean, you have right. to take the good with the bad. It's just the other end of the wave. The universe is balanced. Everyone knows you get the thorn with the rose, but you take it. You take it. That Every is, rose has a star. Listen to me, Ryan. The one I quoted was actually a song from the 60s or 70s. I can't remember the band, but that's actually a line. I, I did want to read this, if you don't mind. Are we ready to close? You can read it. I'm ready to... Okay. Yep. Where was this from? I really do need to... Oh, this is the Tarot of the Spirit again, Pamela Eakins. And she says this. Remember... Living on Earth can be really, I want, this is me, um, then I'll go into the quote. Living on Earth can be really, really challenging, but we're here. It's like, what are you going to do? You can either check out through taking your own life, or you can stay here and you can have the courage to face it. And if you're challenged, and you have, and we all have challenges, I encourage you, helpers are around you. People want to help. Get better, get well, get grounded. 
Be about your work, ma'am. Be about your work, sir. We need you. Get grounded. Get into earth. It start um, really discovering, go to the shadows and figure out why the patterns are there on earth. You know, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten kind of thing. Like stop the patterns. Stop the ancestral curses. Don't bring them forward anymore. Break the chain. Break the chain. Break the chain and be the change that you want to see. Life, excuse me, I quote, Earth is our gift. We find ourselves honored with the exquisitely sensual experience of living on the planet. It comes as a gift that we experience her joys and wonders. It is also a gift to experience her quaking, her tossing and turning. The cracks that open in her surface crack open our psyches. She shakes us into seeing. Such physical breakage can become the greatest pathway to the inner self. On the path through earth, we learn that it is mostly the structures we ourselves erect that fall down and hurt us when earthquakes. We learn to build our foundation upon the most solid and enduring ground. And uh, I just thought that that was beautiful and a good way to close. That's Earth. That's Earth. We did it, guys. Thank you for your patience and our not, followers not that only, we have out there. Not only did we finish Earth today, <clears throat> today, now that we finished Earth, that means we finished the basics. We did all nine planets. We did all ten spheres on the sphere of life. We did all twelve zodiac signs. Yes. So now, in the future, when we analyze whatever and we mention the basics, we don't have to baby our listeners because we could just tell them to go back to the other episodes. Until next time. See you soon. I thank you. And it's really good to spend time with you, Anthony, and I wish you the best till our next episode. Of course, you too. Good night. Good night.